It is summer, which means that we as homemakers have the opportunities in our kitchen to take advantage of fresh flavors, berries, herbs, so many beautiful things available. In our kitchen, this sometimes means a practical, easy to throw together breakfast or brunch idea. Sometimes I like to try my hand at something a little bit more complicated that really highlights a seasonal ingredient. The first breakfast idea I want to share with you today is a stuffed French toast. I've showed it on this channel a few times because we have been enjoying it repeatedly, but today I actually made it with my sourdough brioche, which really makes it that much better. For the strawberry cream cheese filling, I mixed together eight ounces of softened cream cheese, two tablespoons of honey, and a half cup of diced strawberries. I sliced my sourdough brioche in 12 slices, trying to make six servings here of stuffed French toast. If you have not yet seen me make my sourdough brioche, it's actually a very simple recipe. I get the ingredients going the night before in my stand mixer with the dough hook, allow it to rise for eight hours at room temperature, and then I divide it in two, shape, rise, and bake. This makes two loaves. You can get that full recipe over on farmhouseonmoon.com. Of course, to make stuffed French toast, you can use any type of sourdough bread or any store-bought bread for that matter. You don't have to use homemade. For the custard mixture, I whip four eggs, a cup of whole milk, a teaspoon of vanilla, half a teaspoon of cinnamon, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. I lay out six slices of my brioche, spread them with my strawberry cream cheese filling, and then top with the remaining six slices of sourdough brioche. I dip them into the egg mixture and then fry them in butter. taking a break from these delicious summer breakfast ideas to tell you about today's video sponsor, Caraway. I have been using this non-toxic Caraway baking set for a few months now, and I love it not only for the aesthetic, the bread pan especially. I have been making so many bread loaves in it, and the color, it's just a very beautiful set, but also non-stick and non-toxic. It's especially nice, I don't have to line it with parchment paper or oil to make my sourdough products not stick, it just comes right out. But also the storage aspects. So we have this shelf above our refrigerator that I've just for the most part thrown in various baking items without any real storage system to keep them organized. No one likes a cluttered kitchen, including myself. That's why Caraway created iconic cookware and bakeware set exclusive organizers that are designed to fit inside every cabinet to keep your kitchen tidy and clean. Caraway is also designed with your health in mind. The ceramic kitchenware is free of toxic material for guilt-free cooking and baking. The naturally slick ceramic coating makes it non-stick for easy cooking and seamless cleanup. The bakeware set is absolutely beautiful. If you've watched any of my videos in the last couple of months, you've probably seen it make multiple appearances because I'm really loving it here in my kitchen. Caraway is offering Farmhouse On Boon viewers 10% off your order by using the code BOON10 at my link app.carawayhome.com forward slash boon10. It'll also be linked in the description box below. So you can just click the link below, use the code boon10 to get 10% off your beautiful caraway order. Next, I'm going to make a simple breakfast pizza. This works anytime you have a lot of sourdough starter. If you want to use your sourdough discard this way, or if you're starting a starter, and you're saving up a jar of discard throughout that process. For me, I just like to keep a lot of extra on hand to always have pizzas, whether that's for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. For this breakfast pizza, I got my cast iron skillet really hot. I accidentally poured in way too much oil. Off camera, I poured some back in because I guess I was distracted. Then I pour in some sourdough discard. This has been fermenting for, I'm gonna say about 24 hours. So it's nice and sour and my starter is ready to be fed again. So it's the perfect time to use some starter up in a pizza crust. I put it back in the oven and allow it to 
cook until it gets browned and can be easily removed from a well-seasoned cast iron skillet. I have some cooked bacon that I made in the oven. My favorite way to make bacon is always on a sheet pan in the oven because it's less messy, it's very hands-off, and who doesn't love bacon on a pizza? I took advantage of all of that delicious bacon grease in the pan by slicing some tomatoes and roasting them right in that bacon grease. I got them in the oven so they're nice and caramelized. Once the pizza crust is done, I top it with cheese, frying up some eggs in reserved lard that I had from a pork that I got from my sister. Sometimes I'll just pour the bacon grease into a jar. I like to take advantage of that fat that I've already purchased. You know, it's already there on the bacon and you can utilize that. So I'm cooking up some eggs. I'm going to top my pizza crust with the roasted tomatoes, bacon, fried eggs, a little bit more cheese, and some fresh arugula. This one went over really well, shooting this video for several breakfast ideas and everybody was like, why didn't you make 10 of these pizzas? So noted that they loved it. Next up on the list is a simple, easy breakfast skillet. This is one you can throw together on any kind of morning. I got some sausage going in my skillet with onion and a separate pot. I have my lard again. I know I feature this all the time because we love it with some potatoes. I figured why not fried potatoes in this? I'm gonna head to the garden to get some herbs for this dish. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna clip some flowers.
another breakfast favorite that we've been enjoying this summer is a basic sourdough scone. Now today I'm gonna to show you adding blueberries to it, but you can use this scone base and add in chocolate chips, dried cranberries, anything seasonally available is great. Right now we can get a hold of blueberries very easily. We have a you pick place really close to us that we stocked up on. It's something I like to do every year with the kids. Every time a new berry comes out, we go to a you pick place and get them. And so I wanted to make the best use of the blueberries. For these scones, mix two cups of all purpose flour, a half a cup of sugar, a tablespoon of baking powder, a half a teaspoon of salt, together that is the dry ingredients then a stick of unsalted frozen butter i like to grate that in this method works really well with pie crust biscuits anytime you want something flaky you can grate frozen butter into the dry ingredients and then cut it with a pastry cutter you can also use your hands for this next add in the mix in so in this case i did a cup of blueberries and then set that aside for the wet ingredients, I'm mixing up a half a cup of sourdough discard. You can use active starter or discard, either one works. One egg, a teaspoon of vanilla, and three tablespoons of heavy cream. You can also use milk. Fold the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients and then pat the dough out into a circle about eight inches in diameter and cut it into eight equal parts. You can bake this right away on a baking sheet or put it in the refrigerator for up to three days for a longer fermentation. I have been experimenting a lot in my kitchen with doing long fermentation biscuits, cookies, all by utilizing the refrigerator so that the butter doesn't get warm and you end up not getting all the, the flaky benefits of the cold butter. Putting it in the refrigerator for extended periods of time does help with the fermentation because it slows it way down, but it still does work slowly. So this is great because you can make it ahead. You can make several of them ahead, maybe stack them up if you have several cookie sheets and then bake them as needed. To make it a more well-rounded breakfast, I serve mine with raw milk. This feels like we're getting in the protein, the fats, and of course, who can argue with fresh creamy milk. Before baking, I like to brush the tops with cream and sprinkle with a bit of sugar. This is optional, but it does make them more beautiful. And I bake them at 400 degrees for about 25 minutes or until golden brown. Again, you can get this full recipe over on farmhouseonmoon.com if you want the printable version. Also, did I mention I'm working on a sourdough cookbook? So soon, this will all be in printed form. For now though, you can get it over at farmhouseonboon.com. Let's talk about sourdough pastry braids. This is one of those recipes that seems really intimidating but once you get the hang of it, can be a part of your regular flow in the kitchen. And let me explain how. The beautiful thing about this dough is you can get it going several days before you actually wanna make these pastry braids and just have it in your refrigerator. We're gonna start by getting the ingredients going in the mixer, which is three cups of flour, quarter cup of sugar, half cup active starter, three quarter cup whole milk, an egg, a half a teaspoon of vanilla, and a teaspoon salt then allowing it to sit at room temperature to ferment for about four hours. And then you can pop it in the fridge for 12 hours up to three days. You don't have to make these right away. So get it going and then at some point you can carry on with the rest of the pastry process. So the next part of the process is laminating the dough. It's the same thing I did in my sourdough croissants, which I shared on here and on my blog as well as the sourdough Danish pastries. To do this, I want to get my butter smushed out into a six inch by eight inch rectangle. So I put two sticks of butter and a little bit of flour on a large piece of parchment. Then I measure and create little marks and create this six inch by eight inch envelope. And then start by tapping the butter a bit with the rolling pin and then fully rolling it out into the envelope so that it fills it up 
and makes this nice six by eight inch rectangle. I put it in the refrigerator for about 10 minutes so that it can harden back up. The goal with any pastry dough, whenever you're laminating it, is you want the butter and the dough to be about the same softness so that when you roll it out, the butter doesn't run out, but instead creates these very nice flaky layers. I pull my dough that's been fermenting in the refrigerator out and roll it out into a 16 by eight inch rectangle. I get really precise whenever I'm testing recipes and whenever I'm making things for YouTube, but once I get really familiar and comfortable with a recipe, I won't have my measuring tape out. So if that part intimidates you, just know that you're trying to create a dough envelope for the butter. You want the butter completely encased within the dough so that when you roll it out, there's layers of dough, butter, dough, butter. So that's essentially what you're doing. You can really make this whatever size you want. It's nice to follow these guidelines because it just works out really well so that it all fits. Once I encase the butter with the dough, I roll it back out into another 16 by eight inch rectangle and then fold the outer edges of the dough in and then fold it in again so that I create four layers. So I'm folding it in fourths. At this point, I'm going to get it back in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes. This is just to harden all of the layers back up. We have butter in there that could soon be melting, especially if the kitchen's really warm. We have dough that's getting worked a lot. You want to keep everything nice and cold. That's the key with pastry. So you can either wrap it up in plastic wrap or put it in a Ziploc bag. After 30 minutes, I roll it out into another 16 by eight inch rectangle. So this is the second fold. We did the first fold. Now we're doing the second fold. And then you can wrap it up in plastic wrap or a Ziploc bag and put it in the fridge for up to 12 hours. That's what's really cool about this because you can get to this stage and then just put it in the fridge and forget about it. Even honestly, you could, you could go longer than 12 hours. Um, I say two hours up to 12. You could even do a couple of days at this point before rolling it out and making the final pastry. So I like that there are several times throughout this process where you can just pop it in the fridge. And then when you want fresh pastries, you can make up your fillings, roll it out and proceed with the braid. So at this point, I am making the cream cheese filling, which I'm doing by adding eight ounces of softened cream cheese, a quarter cup of sugar, one egg yolk, a teaspoon of lemon juice, and a half a teaspoon of vanilla to my mixer with the whisk attachment. This just helps to bring it all together. I'm going to get my cold dough out of the refrigerator, divide it in two, and then put one half back in the refrigerator because this actually makes two pastry braids and I don't want one to get warm while I'm working with the other. You can also do half in a pastry braid and half in Danish pastries, which it's the same exact dough and I have the instructions for how to shape and assemble the Danish pastries over on my blog, also on this YouTube channel. But that's actually what I did this time. I made one into a braid and then one into the Danish pastries. I roll it out into a 12 inch by nine inch rectangle and then visually divide it in thirds. Leave the middle third open for the fillings and then and then do 10 cuts on each side of that. These are the strips for the braid. I remove the two outer top strips so that I can fold it over and encase the cream cheese and the blueberries at the top and then cross over all of the rest of the strips, kind of angling them down so that they encase the bottom of the pastry braid whenever they reach the bottom. Remember, whenever we added one egg yolk to the cream cheese, I used the remaining egg white to brush the top with an egg wash, which makes it have a nice golden color. And then I put it back in the refrigerator for an hour. You can skip this step. You don't have to do it, but it's nice for the butter to firm back up so that you have less butter leakage during the baking process. And then I bake it at 400 degrees for about 25 minutes or until golden brown. I like to then mix up a little bit of powdered sugar and cream for a glaze. It just tastes extra delicious, totally optional. You don't have to do that. I hope that you enjoyed some of these ideas and ways that you can customize them all throughout the summer and enjoy some fresh summer breakfast for your family. Thank you so much for stopping by our farmhouse.